Park Slope United Methodist Church Social Action Committee. I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. We're very pleased to be hosting this event. We're delighted that Tom Hayden is here in Brooklyn to speak to us and very excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, we'd also like to thank Brooklyn for Peace for the incredible work that they did putting this event together and the incredible work they've done for 25 years uh, supporting peace and justice in Brooklyn. Thank you all for coming out. Good evening. Everybody having a good evening so far? Good. My name is David Tykolsker. I am a vice chair of Brooklyn for Peace. And on behalf of Brooklyn for Peace, we welcome you to what we hope will be a stimulating evening of discussion and provocative thought uh, concerning some of our common problems uh, here in Brooklyn and as Americans and citizens of the world. Uh, Brooklyn for Peace is celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, we have been active in a variety of uh, matters. Uh, we have, uh, been, from the demonstrations at the Metropolitan Detention Center against the uh, roundup of our uh, neighbors and family in the Muslim South Asian Arab communities uh, to our activities to try to stop military recruiting, to our peace fair, uh, to our continuing work for peace and justice and reconciliation in Israel and Palestine, uh, our continuing work to oppose violence in Darfur, and to oppose the American expansion of our military with the Africa Command, uh, Latin America working group that is opposing the coup in Honduras, the expansion of the US military in Colombia to close the School of the Americas, our work against the maintenance and expansion of new generation of nuclear weapons. Uh, Brooklyn for Peace has been active for 25 years in trying to build a culture of peace in the county of Kings. Now, um, I in particular became very active with Brooklyn for Peace when uh, there was a, uh, seemed to be a movement in this country to retaliate for the bombings, the terrorist bombings that we suffered uh, eight years ago um, by bombing the uh, country and then invading the country of Afghanistan. Uh, Brooklyn for Peace opposed that at the time, and um, we have continued to oppose uh, the war in Afghanistan. I think everyone in this room was active and has been active in opposing the war in Iraq, a war that continues. Um, we are, we have spoken out and will continue to speak out against the expansion of the war in Afghanistan into Pakistan. Um, we will continue to speak out against the threats to Iran that seem to erupt every couple of months, depending on the political weather. Uh, we are an educational group, Brooklyn for Peace, and our understanding of education involves two major elements, that it's collective and that it's active. Um, it is collective because we need to empower ourselves to confront and understand the forces that make militarism such a major factor in our society, a factor that continues in this administration as it has since World War II. We are active and we will continue to be active in all of the areas that I have mentioned to you. But we are also an educational group. And one of the many things that we like to do is to read together. Tom Hayden has very generously agreed uh, to sign copies of his books so that we may read it together and think about it. Uh, he'll do that right after his talk this evening. So maybe he'll be right over here if you want to purchase one of his books, um, have it signed by the author himself. 
But we also are trying to build activism as part of our educational work. As you saw, as you came in, Matt Weinstein, Matt, would you raise your hand, please, is trying to organize for us a group of peace and justice activists here in Park Slope, because we find that when we work together with our neighbors, uh, we are better activists and more educated. We've helped to um, have groups go forward in Flatbush and Fort Greene and Bay Ridge, and we're trying to work on one here in Park Slope, and we hope that you'll check in with Matt for about two minutes after uh, tonight's talk is formally over, uh, if you're part of the, oh, I'm sorry, Ed Goldman. The gentleman raising his hand in the purple with the glasses. All right. uh, but we promised as well that we want you to be active. Um, we're going to give you lots of opportunities besides tonight to be active. We will start this evening. Uh, for those who like music, anybody like music in this group? Yes? Okay. At the Brooklyn Lyceum, uh, the kickoff for the World March for Peace and Nonviolence is continuing this evening. If you want to go over there after this talk, we would encourage you to do so. On October 15th, this Thursday, we're going to be, I guess it's a week from this Thursday, think through a common problem. An administration that calls itself progressive is in the process of escalating the war in Afghanistan. Uh, that's what we know. And we need to figure out what we as a community can do about this. Now, to engage in this kind of collective education requires us uh, to respect each other and uh, to understand the contours of how this event is going to proceed. Uh, Tom will speak for about 30 minutes. You'll have then the pleasure or not of having me come back and talk to you about some things. Um, Tom will then take questions. Questions will be one minute in length. Let me repeat that. One minute in length. If you can't on Eisenberg, my vice chair co, <laughs> we Brooklyn for Peace will introduce Tom Hayden. Thank you. right afterward downstairs, uh, courtesy of the church. And one of the nice things about these events is you get to meet old friends and see them again. So I hope people will stay around and have an opportunity just to chat with each other. Um, on behalf of Brooklyn uh, for Peace, I'm very pleased to welcome everybody here this evening. Um, as David mentioned, this is the 25th anniversary year for our organization. And when we started as a small discussion group of parents in a Brooklyn nursery school in 1984, we expected to last only a few months. Uh, but the need for groups such as ours has really continued. Uh, and after 9-11, there were many people in Brooklyn uh, who felt a strong sense of urgency about uh, working for peace. So we have been growing and expanding our range of activities ever since. And sadly, if General McChrystal has his way, uh, we'll be around for another 25 years, um, and we'll all be coming together for our 50th anniversary of Brooklyn for Peace, but let's hope that doesn't need to happen. Um, tonight's program was arranged months ago, but it could not have come at a more crucial moment as our country seems poised for what could be a major expansion of the war uh, in Afghanistan. I'd like to welcome our speaker, Tom Hayden, who has traveled to many places in the world, but um, has not really savored the wonders of Brooklyn. So um, on behalf of everybody, I want to welcome Tom to Brooklyn. Um, now, jot down his many achievements, um, and then I realized that this was ridiculous. Um, for, for those in the audience who are my age, uh, Tom Hayden needs no introduction. Throughout the 60s and 70s, he was at the forefront of the major struggles of our time, working for social justice, civil rights, and for peace. Tom was a founding member of the 
the Students for a Democratic Society, a founding member, and the author of the Port Huron Statement, a document which helped to inspire student activism across the country. Tom was in Mississippi, Georgia, Newark, Hanoi during the height of the war in Vietnam and the streets of Chicago. But I think his contribution is not measured by the list of places or historical episodes he participated in, but in the qualities which he brought and continues to bring to his political work. His energy, commitment, creativity, and courage. I know Tom has friends and family sitting in this room, but even for some of us who aren't family and weren't personal friends, Tom was somebody that you felt like you knew. Um, you could be mad at him and say, why is Hayden doing that? That's crazy. Or a very admiring of him and say, oh, thank God he's doing that. That's great. But as much as anyone from our generation, Tom Hayden represented idealism and hope for a better future. Um, these comments notwithstanding, um, we're gathered here tonight not for an evening of nostalgia. I think most people have come out here on a Friday night out of a sense that our country is a really critical moment and that an administration that has come in with tremendous hopes for change you know, really is on a precipice and that we've come together to do some careful thinking um, and, and to try to plan for effective action. That's as important, that careful thinking and that effective action is as important now as it ever was. And what is so impressive about Tom is not what he did 40 years ago, but that he's never stopped battling for the principles of his youth, and that during his many decades of public service, he has always acted on this principle basis. And it's no surprise, really, that as people come together again to assess the needs of this very difficult moment, uh, that Tom Hayden is still around helping us to do that. So on behalf of Brooklyn for Peace, I'd like to welcome Tom Hayden. Thank you. I wanted to uh, be here to thank uh, Rusty Eisenberg in particular and the uh, Brooklyn for Peace group for being such a great model of neighborhood organizing against foreign intervention, uh, linking the local with the international for so many years. Uh, and the experience of those of us who work at local levels who are truly community organizers uh, is very much worth examining for the role that it plays in social change. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be here and I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, I want to thank the church also, uh, Judy I think it is, the social action chair. Uh, and I want to thank members of my family. You think that I'm from far away, but would the Brooklyn members of my family please stand? We, we are everywhere. <laughs> There's... Oh, they're all, they're all in the back. That's uh, Boswell and Dee and Simone and Troy. Um, and uh, we've had a, an excellent afternoon of tracing Simone's life from the point where she was born, uh, various activities we won't share with you that she experienced in Brooklyn. We went to uh, the former site of Ebbets Field where I have a photo of myself standing there uh, outside a Dodgers game. It was a, a, great, uh, a great afternoon. Um, I, I can give a public speech, I've probably given a million of them when I was in when I was in the legislature in California for 18 years, I felt compelled to go every time everybody asked me to speak for free, 10 people, 1,000 people, whatever, for fear that I'd be accused of refusing to show up in the neighborhood. So I got kind of sick of it after, after 18, 18 years. I got very tired of uh, rhetoric, um, very tired of the process of trying to stir people up and realizing that if an individual can stir you up then you're going to be hung over within 48 hours and somebody will have to stir you up again. 
So I became, um, uh, uh, I guess I had, uh, and I'm still suffering a, a toxic reaction to all that speaking. Uh, so it's more, it's a more conversation I have in mind and some thoughts that I want to uh, share as quickly as I can because these are not simple, <laughs> these are not simple matters. Um, and in a room like this, which it's um, um, uh, set up in a way where I'm at the front and you, you're, you're going so far back I can't even see your eyes, it's difficult to create any sense of community or interaction, but we'll try. Um, I, I, there's a, a couple of points that I want to cover. A point would be too small a, a point, maybe um, a couple of topics. One is some, a, a reflection on how social change works and how we fit into it, um, based on experience mainly. And secondly, to try to apply it to the situation we're in with the Obama administration and uh, what I call and Pentagon calls the Long War, which, uh, if you haven't read their documents, consists of a 50-year war minimum, some say 80, a 50-year war that began with 9-11, uh, went into Iraq, is now proceeding through Afghanistan, will head into Pakistan, includes the Philippines, the Horn of Africa, and leaves out <laughs> Venezuela, Central America, Latin America. This is merely what they call the arc of crisis, which will take a 50-year military commitment. So, Rusty is right, we are in the eighth year of what they consider uh, this long war. And when you think about that, count it up. You're, you're fussing about Obama with me tonight, but Obama will be long gone. This will be 12 presidential terms, 13 presidential terms, 50 years. Uh, people we don't even know will come and go as president of the United States, and the long war will continue. By its very nature, it, it challenges the idea that we live in an accountable democratic society, since they've already planned the next 50 years of your life, your children's lives, your grandchildren's lives, through presidents they haven't even chosen yet. Uh, so we'll try to apply uh, some general ideas about social change uh, to this problem of, you know, where we get the energy and the blueprint for action when we're confronting something this uh, uh, overwhelming. If I could have the water I lost, I didn't want to electrocute myself early. Now, the first thing about the model social change is this. Um, this is a purely voluntary act, but I like to stay in communication with people. Uh, my, my door on email is always open. I like to be in touch with local groups because I believe social change comes from what we used to call below, whatever that is. It's kind of a derogatory location for us. Uh, we the people below the bottoms. Uh, but it is my thought that social change proceeds from below. So, if you would um, circulate this, and um, it may take some time, and if you please write your name, how you wish to be known, and especially your email in a legible way. Uh, I know what you like, what you, you, how difficult it is to enter email addresses and then discover that of the 82 that you've entered, one is defective and it blocks all progress. I, I, I will be in touch with you and we can communicate by email and I can send you my uh, thoughts on current events and I can also put you in touch with Rusty if you're not because she performs an invaluable service that we really didn't have during the earlier movements uh, with Central American wars in Vietnam and that is a, a a way, a way to communicate to people at the local level what's going on with legislation inside the Beltway instantaneously so that you can begin to mobilize. For instance, um, just uh, today we have uh, legislation introduced by Barbara Lee, no other, um, uh, that challenges the funding in Congress for any escalation of the troops in Afghanistan. 
By tomorrow, people all over the country will know this and begin organizing from the local level up in their congressional districts, using it as a tool to become a mobilizing force in the campaign about Afghanistan. But I get ahead of myself. Here's, here's the concept. Um, and it's, it's contained in this book, uh, which is for sale later. It's, I try to simplify it into a notion of two forces in history that result in social change. One, uh, I would call the movements, that is, masses of people who more or less spontaneously gather around a moral grievance and a concrete issue like Afghanistan. Um, they come unexpectedly. The establishment doesn't see them. The media doesn't see them. They arrive on the scene as if miraculously, uh, and they begin to pass through uh, a stage of trial and difficulty, moments uh, where they either make it or they don't. Uh, they march into the mainstream if they make it. Along the way, they form small communities of meaning, small communities of alternative uh, ideas, thoughts, uh, people that sustain each other, perhaps like uh, your organizations in this neighborhood. And there are organizations like yours, or networks like yours, all over the country, as you know. Uh, and, and if they persist, uh, they, they, they find that they're in a, 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 a conflict with the other side, whom I call the Machiavellians, which is just another term for what some would call the power elite or the establishment. I think of the Machiavellians as not the big people that have all the wealth and sit back, but the practitioners of power, the technicians of power, the people that make the deals, that make the system run, that make the institutions run. Uh, and they practice Machiavellian's theorem, basically that the end justifies the means. They, they see democracy and people like ourselves as kind of a nuisance that has to be put up with, uh, that has to be navigated, that has to be manipulated. Uh, and, and they're in this constant fight. Both sides in the course of this struggle between movements and Machiavellians tend to divide in, in several ways, but the easiest way to understand it, because I think we've all been through it, is we divide between more militant and more moderate factions. Uh, movements often start with people who have a, a, a moderate objective, and when they get the taste of the police clubs enough, or they're in prison enough, or they see people martyred uh, or, or defamed, they become more militant in their tactics, and they, have, they, they start to have a desire to change the whole system without even knowing how to define it. They go beyond the initial grievance that they had. Um, and, and, and all the while, new people are joining the movement around the original grievance. So movements tend to divide along this spectrum, but so do Machiavellians. The Machiavellians at first would wish us all away and have complete and total hegemony over all thought so that it is truly one-dimensional and there's no choices, no alternative future. But uh, uh, if a movement begins, they will divide gradually between those Machiavellians who want to crush it, wipe it out, and those who want to accommodate it. It may take a hundred years. It may take a hundred days. But these are the rhythms. Uh, and and uh, I think social change comes when the movement has achieved a sufficient majority around its original goals. And the Machiavellians are so thwarted that they concede, and there's a temporary agreement for a generation or so, to accept a profound reform that nobody thought was possible in the beginning. But as the passage of time seems less than what the activists now want, right? And when we succeed with the right to vote or whatever it may be, our movements begin to demobilize. People return more to everyday life to enjoy the benefits of the reform. 
the political opening, the material resources now at their disposal, the opportunity to live the lives they really want. It's a normal thing to want to enjoy everyday life, especially if it's been enriched a little bit. Um, and at the same time that movements demoralize, de demobilize when they um, succeed, except for those of us who are preoccupied with organizing, 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 the other side, the more hardline Machiavellian side, is reanimated and reinvigorated and becomes uh, much more emboldened in a counter movement because they, be they believe uh, on a very deep level that, that, that their world is ending. We see that being played out today uh, in the reaction to uh, Obama and health care. Uh, the movements persist in their achievements, maybe for a generation, two generations, uh, and they start to demobilize, and then there comes a time when they're underfunded, uh, limitations are placed on them, but they do become part of everyday life. Freedom of speech is part of everyday life for most people. Um, the right to a job, the, the right to an eight-hour day for almost a century was considered a right that had been achieved. The right of women to vote took a hundred years, barely passed, for very Machiavellian reasons, uh, it passed, but uh, then people started arguing about whether the right to vote was really empowerment enough, right? So, so here we are, and I, I'd say the, um, the application to today, and this is where this may seem a little controversial, is we're in the midst of um, a debate over memory, and the debate usually goes like this. The, the movements try to remember the past as a legacy to empower people in the future. And the Machiavellians try to eliminate the memory of the movement in the textbooks and in the naming of buildings and bridges and so on. And the moderates of both sides become like a politicians of history who like to claim that this is the beauty of the American society, that we constantly adapt and reform, and somehow the achievement of these deep reforms, which were so controversial in their time, becomes proof of the resiliency of American democracy in the famous saying, the system works. So there's those responses. I would say that the movement that helped elect Barack Obama is more in the category of a social movement than an electoral movement. Almost always social movements are not political, they are not electoral, they're not around candidates, but they have qualities. And in this case, the rising uh, of two forces, the African American community, which is deeply in the center of the history of social, <coughs> the social movements in our society, and young people as a force uh, came together, not to uh, leave out anyone else, but they came together in numbers that were absolutely unprecedented and which can be rightly said to have made the difference. Now, in a close election, er everybody says they made the difference, and I don't deny that, but these two forces made the difference in, in, in winning a, 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 an election that very few people thought was winnable to begin with and winning in North Carolina, winning in Virginia, uh, winning in the Southwest. Uh, and it was obviously many forces, but that was the force of the social movement that elected Barack Obama. And it's no accident that he was a, a community organizer for a brief period of time, and that he cited this continually and that those who joined that movement uh, for Obama uh, had, will become, in large part, the basis of social activism, in my judgment, for the next 30 years. They are my replacement generation. Um, 
and, and I'm speaking in broad terms, but you know what I mean. I'm talking about people like Jessica uh, Levy, who is at um, University of North Carolina Graduate School in Public Health and spent a lot of time in Central America and found herself suddenly, for no reason she could articulate, joining the Obama campaign so that she could work and she wanted to work in the reddest area of North Carolina. She wanted to work in an area that was overwhelmingly uh, old Confederacy. And, and they said, fine. She said, and I'll just need a little money for an office. They said, fine, you can raise that money. Uh, she went down there. She had to raise the money and then put up these big signs where I think you get a taste now of what it would have been like for her then putting up for the first time in American history big signs promoting an African-American candidate for president of the United States in Brunswick, North Carolina. Um, and, and her goal was to uh, uh, set the, the greatest record in Brunswick history for the number of new people registered to vote and then the greatest number uh, who would turn out on election day to vote. And, and she had to apply community organizing techniques to generate a base of volunteers who wanted to do this and set goals. She exceeded the goals well before election day and they were, well, they were over the top by the end of the election and they lost overwhelmingly in that county. But Obama won by 0.01% or something like that in the state. So. Those are the kind of people that I'm speaking of, and I think that they um, uh, represent the new wave of activism, and we're in a period where they themselves, as in the course of any social movement, having succeeded, are now having the experience of being demobilized, fragmented, wondering what to do, to do next. But they will gather force, and, and um, I think uh, will be heard from for, for decades to come. They, the, uh, the victory they achieved, as with many of these victories, when movements and Machiavellians intersect to create this moment of change, was a mixed victory. Um, the candidate who said he came from a, le a left or progressive tradition, a community organizing tradition, his first speech, I believe, was given at a college where I was teaching against South African apartheid uh, back in the uh, early 80s. Um, so he had a, a movement and community organizing background, a sensibility, and said that he was going to run as a centrist. He said quite openly and honestly that he was going to change his original orientation on any number of issues, um, like health care, uh, to run as a centrist both in order to win and in order to govern. This meant that his victory would be ambiguous if you were in a social movement, because movements are not built around um, achieving centrist goals, are they? But it was, to me, a perfect uh, way to conceive of a formula for work in this generation that we're in. If he says he's running as a centrist, is it not an invitation to build a new left. Isn't this where I came in 50 years ago? Doesn't it mean that until we push the center in a more progressive direction, we will be constantly dissatisfied? Is our work to complain about him, or is our work to take up the task of building a movement that he will have to respond to in the course of events? Or is it both? One of the most painful aspects of this, I remember I, I started yelling at the ceilings because I, I knew my fate was sealed during the, the, the New Hampshire debate when he, he had been taking an anti-war position. Remember, it was people like ourselves in the Chicago Peace Movement who literally organized the rally against the war in Iraq and invited him a promising new state senator and candidate to come up on the stage and speak against Iraq, where he gave the speech, which might have been uncanny or accidental, who knows, that gave him the issue that defined his difference more than any other between himself and Hillary Clinton. 
saying that it was a dumb war. And if you read the speech, it was actually quite an excellent speech in 2002. So the, for the first time, a peace movement had launched a successful presidency. We had launched presidential campaigns. We had gotten politicians from the center to address our concerns as a peace movement. But this was the first time that a candidate had been propelled to the presidency more than any other issue uh, on the single issue of the war in Iraq. It was other things. There was the racial question. There, was, there were all kinds of deep things at stake. But I was quite pleased with that and thought, well, maybe here's a chance that the peace and justice constituency will be seen as a very special interest group as opposed to a special interest group. Maybe we'll finally be noticed as a factor, for heaven's sakes. We don't ask for much. We just ask for attention to our issues. And, and here was the possibility. And then this night, you'll remember it well, when they asked about um, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, when he said, if there's actionable intelligence, I will go after the terrorists in those countries. And he fell into this agreement with the John Kerry and Democratic Party uh, consensus. Uh, I don't know how these consensuses get formed, but um, it's not the movements that form them, it's the Machiavellians. You know what I'm talking about. We have to not be uh, defensive, we have to not seem weak on peace. We have to abandon our anti-war roots in the 1960s and come out with some in favor of some war, especially if we're against some other war. Uh, and it had all of these telltale signs of a campaign that was against the war in Iraq in some sense, but was compensating for that by being for the war in Afghanistan. And I'm not saying it was all political. There was a, a rational argument that Afghanistan was the center from which uh, New York and other parts of our country were attacked and Iraq was not. And there were all these arguments going on and on. But I felt, uh-oh, here we go. Because I, I knew, and anybody paying attention knew, this is not about one of these wars. This is about all these wars. This is about the long war, the 50-year war, that just transitions from one battleground to the next until you discover the panoramic fact that all the battlegrounds are Muslim land and Muslim resources. That's what they have in common. This goes on and on and on. And I thought, oh, poor Obama. He's going to be elected on an anti-war platform and he's going to start a war. Because then other things that are tragic took over, like having to keep your word. Now, some of my friends say, let's Let's keep the president to his word. I said, no, no. We, we have an even harder problem. We have to get him to break his promise to, start a, to continue the war in Afghanistan. Um, and, and so here we are, and I don't, think, I don't think for a moment that he thought we would be where we are tonight and he would be where he is tonight, facing these generals and these advisors. The good news, it seems to me, is that 75% more or less of the Democrats who answer the phone and tell the opinion survey people what they think are against this war in Afghanistan. 70 or 75%. A majority of all Americans, and these are just the Americans who are polled, you know, a relatively conservative sample. Uh, and, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I wonder why it is. People say there was no peace movement during Iraq, there's no peace movement, I don't believe that for a second. But if there was no peace movement, why are 75% of Democrats against this war? Just instinct? No. No, they went through this with Iraq. They were lied to. They were tricked. Uh, they, they, you think it's bad now for us? If, Remember when your organization was formed in the early, the early months of the Iraq war, it was virtually treasonous to stand up for peace. We were at zero. Uh, it, took, it took some bravery to just go out in the streets. Uh, and, and 
a lot happened. There were, by my count, 12 demonstrations uh, during those years of more than 100,000 people. Some 500,000 people. Several times, people like Rusty and UFPJ helped organize those demonstrations. People like yourselves went to them in New York and Washington. Those were unnoticed, maybe, by the media, but that's a lot of people. The, uh, the, the people in this country turned against Iraq as a mistake faster than they did in the Gallup polls uh, uh, during Vietnam. Uh, when we used to have an underground media and the Berkeley Barb, suddenly we found that we had the Dixie Chicks and Michael Moore. We had big time bands and musicians and documentarians who were breaking all box office records. Um, we, we, we had an anti-war movement that grew from the margins to the mainstream to success in 2006 in changing the Congress and 2008 in electing a president and it did not go away. That's why 75% of Democrats today are inclined to be against Afghanistan because of our work. I don't mean us in the small sense of the organizers who go out on street corners and knock on doors. I mean in the larger sense of all the people that identified with that movement and who are very skeptical of these wars. So that's a huge asset, and that has got the attention of the President, the Congress. There's, they're, they're, they're worried because, obviously, if you're going to continue a war and escalate a war and you lose the base of your own political party, who do you turn to? The Republican Party? Well, they'll egg you on to keep the war going because they want to defeat you. Their goal is, is, to, is to defeat Obama and defeat everybody they can <coughs> next year. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a very positive situation if you look at everything as I tend to from the point of view of organizing. What's the possibility here? People are ahead of us. People are ahead of us. How, how could we organize 70% of the Democrats? That's tens of millions of people who are already convinced. Uh, so it seems to me we have to think through uh, how, how this may play out. And, and uh, I would just say very simply that Without doing very much in the last eight months, we've already become a huge complicating factor for those that want to continue the long war. Now it's up for us to, do, to really do something. <laughs> we, we, we're not surfing here on a wave of public opposition. We should be also trying to stir up the waters. And I'll tell you this from my 20 years in electoral politics in general, uh, politicians will never do anything that their base doesn't expand, expect them to do. They want to be Machiavellian. They want to succeed. They want to be in power. Their imperative is to remain in power and, if possible, to get a little more power. So if they're in a safe democratic district, that's not enough because they want more Democrats elected so that it's more possible for them to gain power by becoming the chair or vice chair of a subcommittee so losing Democratic seats is painful for, for Democrats, even the ones that are in safe seats, because it diminishes the reach of their power. And so what we do at the base determines how far they will go uh, at, at the uh, congressional level. And, and I think with that in mind, um, uh, the, the mere organization of this many people in this church at this time should be nerve-wracking to your elected representatives, who I believe are Jerry Nadler and Yvette Clark and Ed Torres, is it? Yeah. Yeah. How about Nidia Velasquez? How is she? Not good enough. Well, that's what they don't like to hear. Let's hear that a little louder. Not good enough? What's her name? This is what... This is what they really worry about, is that people in their districts, and I've been one of these people, I'm not exaggerating this, they worry. Even if they're safe, they're worried all the time about, they're just worried. <laughs> they're insecure, they have a security deficit. Uh, and so, 
If, if you demand that they become co-sponsors on Barbara Lee's legislation to cut off funding for more troops, that'll make them worry. And they'll tell all their colleagues, these people in Brooklyn, they've got me worried. I'm worried about them. What, what, what are you worried about? Well, you know, we could lose some seats and then I won't have my chairmanship. Um, I'm not saying they're not good people. Some are, some aren't. You read about them every day, you make your own judgment. But basically, they're the same in the sense that they will go no farther than their base. So if the base is progressive, if the base is awake, if the base is organized, if the base is, is loud, they will respond. And when they respond, it has a ripple effect. Now, I'm not limiting this to a congressional strategy, but it seems to me extremely important to try to push Congress into opposition to the administration on this issue. This is not 1967. We're not talking about dump LBJ. We're talking about dump Afghanistan in order to save the president from his own doing. That's what can happen. This is a very serious problem. And I'm, and I'm not trying to channel everybody into you know, the, the safe and convenient uh, 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 tactic of making phone calls to Congress and scheduling appointments. I think that we do have to look, though, for the limited levers that we have in order to influence decision making. This is uh, a, a very democratic country, but it's not democratic enough. So you have to look for where you can have some leverage. Uh, and I say that the leverage is around challenging the pillars of the policy through people power. One pillar of the policy is public opinion. When public opinion is against a war and it's solidifying, that becomes a drag on the war making process. When public opinion is uh, that concerned, then another pillar is in trouble. When you start going to the uh, recruiter stations, I'm sure they have them all over Brooklyn trying to get these young young people mesmerized with the glamour of the military and if you have anti-recruiters out there in front and you have high school parents and community college parents and people meeting demanding that all sides of the story of Afghanistan be told before their children be dragged off into that battle uh, uh, for glory or for money or some combination of both those are important the reputation is a very important pillar. When you have clergy, when you have clergy of all faiths raising the immorality of torture which is integral to the prosecution of an unpopular war, that wears on the reputational pillar and so on. So you're trying to think of the pillars that are necessary. The, the one that is the, the most necessary, I suppose, um, after public opinion, everything is derivative, public opinion, is the economic pillar. Who's going to pay for this? What are we talking about? The economy is in shambles. The stimulus is being used to send money to state and local governments who are then cutting their own budgets. Stiglitz and Bilmus, the experts on this, have studied it. They're talking about $3 trillion ultimate direct and indirect cost for Iraq. Afghanistan, by my estimate, and the, the accounting is kind of sneaky here, but by my estimate, six billion a month right now in counting. So you're talking about another trillion dollar war uh, uh, on Obama's uh, uh, tenure, eight years at this rate of spending on Afghanistan is roughly a trillion dollars. Um, then uh, you're talking about uh, casualties I haven't had time today, but I do it on a monthly basis. The casualties are now at an all-time high as a result of the fact that we sent in 21,000, more or less, more soldiers. Uh, they're fighting in Kandahar, they're fighting in Helmand, uh, they're fighting all over the place. They're talking about winning the, through hard fighting in two years, followed by 12 years of nation building. You add the cost of this up, in terms of human casualties, it would mean 1,100 additional dead Americans during Obama's term of office, dead in Afghanistan. Not talking about Iraq, not talking about Pakistan, Afghanistan. 
at a cost of a trillion dollars in Obama's two term. This doesn't make any sense. And there's no one in that room down there at the White House, the secure room, pointing this out. I don't know where they think this money will come from, but, but Congress has got to be given a, a, a sharp jolt because Congress has the keys to the funding. And you cannot achieve Obama's promise. You cannot achieve health care. You cannot achieve $150 billion investment in clean energy. You cannot achieve more money for our public schools, our colleges, and our universities. You cannot preserve social security. You cannot preserve our social safety net and see a trillion dollars go out the door for Afghanistan on top of a trillion dollars out the door in Iraq. It can't be done. That is a pillar that is going to collapse. Um, so why is this going on? Well, that could just get us all started all night, so I want to just short circuit that discussion. Some will say it's imperialism, you fool, Tom, it's just the nature of the beast. But not all imperial powers have acted in precisely the same way. Uh, what, what's the, as Aristotle would say, what's the proximate reason here? What, what's, what's the immediate reason that's going on? And I've got an idea that uh, Dan Ellsberg came up with from his long experience in the Pentagon and in the Peace Movement. He said he'd studied this process of escalation. And he said, history shows, the Pentagon Papers shows, and I would say the history of this war shows that administrations, when they reach a stalemate, escalate in order not to lose. It's about the reputation of a superpower which involves just an image, but also a claim on resources. A, a claim on power, a claim on resources. And when you invest yourself with the image of being the sole superpower, which many do, then you can't allow yourself the appearance of a retreat before a small disorganized power. Can't be done. Um, Clausewitz, if you go back and you read military history, Clausewitz actually said that the most difficult military maneuver is a strategic retreat. That's what our president and our country has to do. We have to engage in a strategic retreat. And if he chooses to do that, if he has the wisdom to do that and the fortitude to do that, he will be attacked by the military, he will be attacked by the Republicans, and who will come to his defense? And how will he succeed in his political adventure? I'm not asking for sympathy. This is a situation he and others have put themselves into. But I am saying our task is hard enough in ending this war. It's even harder because we have to save the presidency from the alternative. Uh, we have to find a way uh, to get our country to accept strategic retreat because the alternative is, is a rapid decline of our economy and a shadow over our future. And people will say, well then won't the terrorists advance if we retreat? <laughs> you know, it, I hate to spend a lot of my life trying to dig people out of the holes they dug themselves into, but we do have to answer that question. And my answer is uh, backed by some research that says that the process of American occupation and sending 68,000 troops into Afghanistan to become 100,000, 200,000, always escalating so as to not lose, is the primary factor in galvanizing nationalist and cultural resistance to the United States and unifying people. And that, and that actually um, uh, liberation movements often find their only unity in the stubbornness of the foreign presence in their midst. Uh, and so we could actually be creating 
more of a terrorist threat or so-called terrorist threat by staying than by individually killing a terrorist leader or a Taliban leader here or there in the mountains of the Hindu Kush range for the next five years. So that would be the argument. I think we have to argue that our country is less safe. I think we have to argue that our country cannot afford this. I think we have to argue that our troops do not deserve to be sent into a war for a government that is nothing but a group of drug, drug lords and landlords and warlords. And we have to say that uh, this is the end of the promise of Obama if we do not get out of the nightmare of Afghanistan. It's that serious. And while we would like to believe that it's up to our leaders, we know in our bones and we know in our history that our leaders can't do it without us creating the conditions that make them do it and make it possible. Thank you very much, and I hope that gives you some clarity. Peace movement. I'm going to ask Ben Broad to explain how we're going to do that. Stephen? Tall order there. Um, I don't know if I can exactly explain it, but I am here to ask you for your support. Um, as David said, I'm Ben Broad of Brooklyn for Peace. And Eddie here, Eddie McWilliams, is coming down, also from Brooklyn for Peace, to join me. Uh, as we thank you all so much for being here. Uh, on behalf of Brooklyn for Peace, this is our 25-year anniversary, which is amazing. So let's give it up for Brooklyn for Peace. <laughs> in this neighborhood, in this Brooklyn borough, in the city, and beyond. Uh, as times have gotten hard for everyone and every organization, including us, um, we have been increasing our activity and our visibility. Uh, this costs money. We now have a staff person, Eddie, my dear friend, Edward McGlynn. And Eddie's going to eat, you know, as we all do. Um, my day job, incidentally, is as Deputy Director for Earth Day New York, another nonprofit. And I can say from personal experience, day in, day out, trying to raise money to fight the good fight, you know, it's hard. And we really do need your support. Um, not only do we have a staff person, but we have these amazing new brochures, which you can pick up at the front. They're literally hot off the presses. And they actually also are printed by a fantastic green printer in New Jersey, uh, Stuyvesant Press, which if any of you have printing needs, uh, it's soy-based ink, it's 100% recycled content, uh, because I know and you know that saving the world happens on many levels. Um, stopping the military-industrial complex and transforming you know, our economy to printing on recycled paper and soy-based ink. And that's what Brooklyn for Peace cares about, you know, the little and the small. It's all about the movement. We need your support because we're constantly out there campaigning, raising awareness at the farmers markets, at the Atlantic Antic this Sunday. We'll be there. We'd love you to join us. You know, whether it's a block party or a potluck in the park, Brooklyn for Peace is out there in our communities trying to raise this awareness, and we're very successful. Uh, we've been collecting literally thousands of signatures, petitions, letters that we're sending, you know, to our Congress people. Exactly, you know, what Tom Hayden was talking about, which I know we all believe in, which is this, you know, pressure on Congress and on the government to do the right thing. So, if you can give a hundred dollars, sounds like a lot, but you know, as far as this movement's concerned, I know that you know that it costs much more than that to make this happen, to print these brochures. You know, to send them to Congress, to pay Eddie, all these little things do add up. And, you know, Brooklyn for Peace needs you. Straight up. <laughs> That's why I'm here. So if you can, you know, open your wallets, your checkbooks, um, you can write a check to Brooklyn for Peace. It's tax deductible. Uh, you can even use your credit card in the back of the room. Uh, we would be happy to take your money in many forms, including cash. Um, as my friend said to me, I think last night, in this economy, you know, cash is the new black Amex, you know, so that's, it's what we got, and we're going to use it. So please, 
give it to us. We will print these brochures. We will continue to do our great work. I think David um, eloquently was giving the introduction and broke down some of our many events that are coming up, all of which Tom Hayden, you know, touched on. Showing up at counter recruitment stations. We're going to be there. We need you to be there. Um, the next time that we are going en masse is, let's see, October 16th, a Friday. That's a couple weeks. We can all get together again uh, at several locations around this borough uh, to end the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and stop sending our young people to die uh, for unwinnable wars. So please, you know, join us uh, on that day, October 16th. Pardon? Oh, shoot, then. I guess our thing here is wrong, that's unfortunate, but okay, you all know, you've got your calendars, it's a Friday, be there. Um, we're going to be leafleting at three um, recruitment, anti recruitment centers doing anti-recruitment work from four to six. Tom Hayden <clears throat> has been around since 1960 to Barack Obama. This is his book, his most recent book. Half the contribution that you're going to make is going to go to Brooklyn for Peace, so we want you to buy the book. We want you to read the book. We want you to talk about the book. We want you to ask Tom Hayden questions. You've got one minute. One minute. Tom, Tom is going to repeat the question if you're not loud enough. So you can be shy, but Tom will repeat the question. But you got one minute, and I really will step on your toes if you're longer. In the back. Yeah. The sound carries well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. First of all, let me just tell you where I'm framing my questions from, and that is that I think one possibility as to why the movements arise and evaporate in the United States is because people like you dig grave graveyards, grave graves for them in the Democratic Party every four years. You've I'll candidly admit it, you got behind Obama. You got behind Obama even though you did not really believe in him as a candidate. You believed in him because of the social movement that gathered around him. So I guess my question is, I have two questions. One is, where is that social movement now? Where is what? Where is that social movement now? And also, do you and your associates in the little uh, cocktail party at the Nation magazine and that oh. you, do you, is there any issue, could a Democrat ever come out in favor of anything, as Obama did? Obama was very candid, as you knew and as you said, that he was going to widen the war in Afghanistan. You knew he was going to do that. So, my question is, is there any issue, is there anything a Democrat could, or could say or do that would keep you folks from channeling progressive support for the Democratic Party during every election cycle? Okay. But it was framed as a question, but um, there's, there's, look, I'm a, I'm a, a Democrat. Um, I'm an independent Democrat. I'm a maverick Democrat. There's two ways to simplify it, to look at political parties. One is from above, the other is below. My constituency in Los Angeles are immigrants, African Americans, Latinos, environmentalists, women, trade unionists, they ain't going anywhere. Uh, they're looking for whoever is the strongest candidate in a Democratic primary. My, can't, my constituents also were always Greens. I would ask Green Party members, literally, to save me by re-registering Democrat for two days, and I'd give them an envelope, and after they voted for me as a Democrat, they could go back to being a Green because in my district, 14% of it was green. So, so the constituency that, that I represented during the time I was in politics was not really represented by the hierarchy of the Democratic Party. But occasionally, there were movements, as there were in the 60s, uh, that mobilized that constituency, and the Obama movement was, was one of them. So, if you listen carefully to my words, I don't think what I said was an endorsement of the Democratic Party as a party. Oh, oh, that, oh, oh thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next. No! Hold it! That's hey. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Yes. Where's the movement now? And is there any issue that you wouldn't get? He's entitled to it. Right here. I'm not afraid of this question. Let me ask a question. 
My, uh, my name is Arun Agyar. Thank you for your presentation and for all your contributions. I have a three-word question and an elaboration. Stop me at the end of the three words, if you wish, or let me, let me elaborate. My three-word question is, what about Gandhi? And the elaboration is, today is Gandhi's birthday. In India, we called it Gandhi Jayanti. <laughs> Who knows about that, and how is it relevant? They started the march today, and that's why the concert at the Lyceum tonight. Um, and probably 100 people gathered at Union Square at the statue. Um, three months, I, I really need your advice, because about three months ago, I found, co-founded uh, the new Gandhiji Community Center of Sunset Park. And if anybody is in Sunset Park, I'll be at the reception. I'll be happy to meet you. And we are really looking for, do we go back to what Gandhi had to say then, or do we look for a new direction based on Gandhi, King, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and what direction do we take? And uh, one more thing I should say, and I don't know whether it is foolish. It might even be dangerous. I'm a non-aligned candidate for the WBAI local station board, and this will have a bearing on that. <laughs> Thank you um, uh, for, uh, for all of us. The, um, I don't know what it means, what about Gandhi? I mean, to me, um, the, the nonviolent civil disobedience tradition has made self-evident achievements, great achievements. Um, it's, it's not a solution to the riddle that I keep looking at. I don't know what the solution is, but obviously, if you look at the, the history of the Gandhi movement and the outcome in India, uh, or if you look at the uh, civil rights movement and the outcome for King in America, uh, huge achievements, and yet uh, more needs to be understood. Um, I don't want nonviolence to become a religion. I think nonviolence deserves consider, you know, consideration as a spiritual path. Um, but it seems to me that violence, with all of its uh, adverse consequences, uh, is often taken up for justifiable reasons by people. It doesn't mean that violence is a solution either. So I'm not. Um, that's not my, my framework. My framework is social movements uh, and how social movements can have the greatest effect uh, while doing the least harm. And sometimes they're political, sometimes they're violent, often they're nonviolent. Uh, they take different forms, but social movements have particular characteristics. You know, they have universal claims, specific objectives. They mobilize people who haven't really been part of the process before. Uh, they have a huge impact on institutions, and um, I don't, I don't, I don't draw the line between violence and nonviolence. I can be misunderstood on this, especially on Gandhi's birthday, but, but um, I don't. Uh, I do think the thing about Gandhi that's often uh, not mentioned is his collective writings and the study, the historical study of the whole movement he led and what happened to it should be basic uh, to our education in our schools and as activists. He's, he's like Francis of Assisi, gets reduced to like a birdbath. <laughs> you know, kind of a, a wonderful, simple, pious man. Uh, but you're talking here about 50 years of struggle and battles and uh, confrontations with the empire and so much to be uh, learned from that period it just can't be reduced to are you nonviolent or not which often uh, becomes the case it's similar with dr. King I spent last year reading his graduate papers uh, they're published uh, in several volumes um, and it's quite amazing to read the the depth of his reflections and the quality of his writing when he was 20, 22. Uh, he also gets reduced by many, you know, to one or two ideas. But the consideration that he put into um, violence, nonviolence, community organization, 
the role of institutions. It's all there. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, text for people to, uh, to study and draw their own conclusions. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hayden, would you agree with me that it would be absurd to abandon Barack Obama at this point, uh, so, you know, constructive uh, criticism, so critical support of support of criticism is one thing. Holding his feet to the fire is one thing. But to abandon him after eight and a half months in office, when most presidents serve four years or even eight years, seems absurd uh, to me, considering that the Republican opposition is that much worse. And uh, we should we should put pressure on him, yes, but we should not abandon him unless we have a better alternative. The, the question was, uh, do I agree with him that we should not abandon Barack Obama, but you know, criticism, pressure, feet to the fire, but not abandon him given the Republican alternative? Yeah, I, I don't know people who are abandoning him. Here's what you know. I think there are these patterns. I won't say laws, but just patterns that. Um, Given the way people think about politics, um, it becomes uh, very, it becomes progressively more difficult to justify these policies unless you sound like an apologist. So if people abandon him, it will be through a mixture of his own policies provoking that reaction. He abandoned us. Yeah. Well, he'll, he'll, I don't know if you were with him to begin with, but the, I'm talking about the people who were. Um, the, the, um, we had this discussion today over cocktails at the Nation. <laughs> so, you know, people, people are who they are, and they look at it, and they their expectations were maybe misplaced or too high or whatever, or they don't have a, a concept of a, a slow institutional change or whatever. They expect certain things. And there will be a falling away, and this would be what I would say to those people, but also to the, uh, the White House, that you can't afford a falling away of your progressive base, which was marginal to begin with. We, you, you, you know, we can't defend the indefensible. Afghanistan is indefensible. And you will lose people. And if the margin of victory, and I'm not saying it was the only margin, but if the margin of victory was heavily voluntaristic, people who do not believe, do, do not belong to the old machinery of politics, but belong to the new networks of voluntary politics, they can easily be lost just as easily they could be, they were gained. So you, could, you, you will lose congressional seats next year, and you will be blamed for that, and it will make your reputation suffer and make it harder for you to be reelected four years from now. And there's nothing I can do about that. Because um, if people are turned off, they're turned off. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a very big problem. I realize that uh, it's, it's much bigger than him. I mean, you think he's got problems. Have you checked out the United States Senate? Oh my god. Our health care destiny is in the hands of four or five senators who represent about 3% of the American people and about 3% of the electoral vote, and they have this stranglehold. And, um, you know, it, we're probably the only democracy in the world that requires a 60% majority to get anything done. I'm talking about the filibuster. Um, and we have these states that represent no people that have two senators, and California and New York that represent, five or six states represent Majority of the electoral vote, but they just get two senators each, and so on. So, and one reason that uh, I like to point out that people, I was talking to Greg Grandin today at the cocktail party over at the Nation. <laughs> He's a, a Brooklyn person, 56 years, is it here? Uh, 40, 46. You, yeah, you look 56. <laughs> and he's a great Latin American expert who 
just uh, interviewed uh, President Chavez of Venezuela uh, for the nation, and um, we're, t we're talking about this problem of um, the um, on Honduras. If you look at the inner political structure of the United States, the reason Obama doesn't know if he can do anything more about Honduras is because he dare not let the question be brought to the floor of the House and Senate. Because he'll be beaten on it by these yahoos. And he can't afford a beating on the issue while he's in the midst of health care. So it's almost like he's hoping that Lula will take care of this problem with Obama in the background, which probably won't work. So, you know, one thing that I clearly always disagreed with Obama about is this idea that we were post-racial and post-partisan. Um, it was a nifty idea for talking to voters, but in fact, we have some of the most gridlocked, ossified, uh, backward institutions in the world. And we think of them as, you know, America's great gift to the democratic experiment. But it's terrible. And, and they will do everything they can to reject him as a foreign body if he tries to implant himself through the democratic process in Washington. Um, so, and I, I also worry, and I'll say this, uh, I hope you uh, respect the spirit in which I say it, that there are far too many people out there uh, that would like to kill him. I have been imprinted, it's not in my DNA, but I've been imprinted by my experience in the 60s. I have seen this before. It doesn't always turn out the same way, but it's absolutely eerie the way it's turning out. The, uh, whether you think that there were conspiratorial assassins that took out the Kennedys and King and Malcolm X, whatever you think of the specific histories, one thing that was a major factor was the creation of a sufficient atmosphere of absolute hate absolute demonization that was sufficient with or without a conspiracy to stir people into violence. And I think that's happening now. I think about it every minute. I thought about it every minute of the campaign. The only thing that will prevent it is a fear among those people of the reaction that will come visiting itself upon them if they undertake it. And I don't think they're afraid of much, but we do have that to fear also. Anything that demonizes his character or personalizes it adds to that atmosphere, and I would caution uh, against that approach. Yeah? Um, it, it's certainly true that uh, Martin Luther's King, Luther King's thought has been reduced and sort of um, He's reduced to being an alternative to violence. Simplified. Just that way. Um, and there are other political and intellectual traditions of the black and African American communities that don't even make it to that right. status. There's CLR James, or W.B. Du Bois, right. um, the NAACP, or even uh, Malcolm X and the, the Black right. Panther Party. And I wonder. Um, if you think it would be a good idea to try at this time to learn more from those traditions and this, if that might be at the least um, a way of building a broader uh, anti war or activating a broader anti and more vocal and active anti war base, especially in light of what you just said. She's, she's saying, would it be helpful to have more of an acquaintance with and education around? the uh, many other uh, movements, more outside of the system, more radical movements. Uh, it's to be wished for. I think one of our jobs is to raise non-conforming children and pass on non-conforming lessons and to educate about case studies 
and to just ask people to read and read and read. I, I would say, um, so if I sit in a lot of meetings where people try to make sense of the 60s, and they never agree among themselves, and they didn't agree in the 60s among themselves. So uh, it's another thing to ask for what is the lesson with the capital L of the past. I don't think there is a lesson uh, in, in, in that sense, but, but to become familiar with the conflicts and the conversations and the disputes uh, is, is obviously really, really essential. I don't know how to do it in this media environment, but I think Rusty tries to do it in her teaching over at Hofstra, and I try to do it in my writings. This book has a very strange and interesting um, history. It goes like this in two directions at once. It says, here's a history of the 60s, beginning in the 50s. That's an alternative history to the idea that it was all drug, sex, rock and roll, violence, bedlam, nothing to be learned from it. It actually has a narrative whole. There's a narrative truth to it. And I take it through the end of the 60s in about 1975, Wounded Knee. Um, and then, that's the first half. Then the second half starts now, it's 2008-2009. Looking back, uh, the back 40 years, and what happened to the forces and the personalities and the organizations that we left in the first half of the book. And I won't tell you the, the conclusion, it's too lengthy, but the one thing that constantly startles me among people who consider themselves smart, literate, well-read, capable of argument, is how little in history of the past 50 years has anyone been right in their prediction as to how it would turn out. <laughs> Do you feel that way? <laughs> Whether you think it turned out well or not so well, didn't it surprise you? Didn't th <laughs> Isn't there an element of it that's beyond the power of prediction? And the, what's empowering about that is it means things are possible, and what's humbling about it is you've got to be very careful about being too dogmatic, because nothing seems to have gone the way all these very smart people thought it would. It's a, it's a tough thing to conclude, yes? Yeah, well, first I'm feeling a kind of passionate gratitude for the creativity of your thinking and the, your willingness to think things through in a very fresh, strategic way. And in that light, I'm wondering if you've given much thought to what a plan would be on Afghanistan. For example, it seems that you and many others from right to left can make an argument that military war is not a successful strategy against this, what's so-called terrorism. But I think one could make an argument that development is a, can be a successful strategy. And I wondered if you have done any thinking in terms of a real paradigm shift that rather than argue for this strategic retreat, which I think is uh, chillingly, would be chillingly difficult. Yeah, chillingly to difficult. See, to Compared see to positive, the alternative, it's not so difficult. But the notion of a paradigm shift, to yeah. say, let's go for development in Afghanistan, could be something. Yeah, it, the alternative uh, to war would be development in Afghanistan. She asks whether that kind of paradigm shift would be a good thing. And I, I often get... Uh, I'm uh, confused in my own thinking about what I think is reasonably likely to happen given what they've done to themselves or what we've done to ourselves versus what I would like to see in an ideal world. Uh, and and, and, and um, it's, it's partly related to my pondering how hard it's been for me to predict correctly. I don't know how to predict this. What I, would, what I would say is that you're right, in general, I just don't see this president, this Congress, these Europeans agreeing to that kind of paradigm shift. So we need to find a strategy that gives us leverage for that shift. At, at present, the truth is that 93% of all the money bound for Afghanistan is military. Despite all the talk 
by all the generals about we need development and we need diplomacy, we need balance, it's really all military, 93%. It doesn't mean the other seven is development. It's for categories called civilian. And, and often you find generals doing civilian things, like the ambassador to Afghanistan is a general. Uh, and so it's not even 7%. And that's kind of harrowing to realize that despite what they say, the, the, the numbers prove the lie to the argument. Now, the Progressive Caucus, um, Raul Grijalva from Tucson, the representative, good fellow, um, he tried to get the Progressive Caucus to come up with an alternative and he failed. But he did write a sort of a position paper with Mike Honda, a Democrat from California, that it was along your lines, and I think you can go online and get it. Uh, it wasn't what I would necessarily say, but they said, why don't we flip it? Why don't we have 90% development and 10% military? And by development, we mean food and medicine and schools and basic development, not contracts with NGOs about urban and uh, suburban development on the uh, outskirts of Kabul. Um, direct stuff. Um, that's gotten nowhere, but, it's, but, it's, but I think it's a very, very good argument, uh, and it should be maintained as the frustration grows and the quagmire deepens and things get worse and worse. They will be forced by us, I think, and some of them by their own think realization that the more they do this, the deeper their problems become. And I think they will then look for um, another word for uh, strategic retreat would be exit strategy. Right. Right. And but now they still think that they will break the back of the Taliban with two more years and 20 to 40,000 more troops. And maybe, and this is their real hope of hopes on the deepest recesses of the administration, is that they will capture or kill Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar, and then just get the hell out of there. That's kind of the wet dream of the administration. <laughs> and I say, well, good luck. What would you say on a scale of rational thinking would be the percentage possibility of that. And how long will you give that percentage? And how many people will die and how much more money will be spent? I grant it's a possibility, but many things are possible. Remember Cheney said, if there's a 1% chance of a threat, we have to go all out in Iraq. Would you say, this is a 1% possibility or what is it? It just, they can't give it up. Yeah. Yeah, welcome to Brooklyn, Tom. Hi, my name is Mitchell. Why do people say that? I, I've never been in a place where people say, welcome to Brooklyn. My name is Mitchell Cohen. I'm from the Brooklyn Greens. Um, a lot of what you're saying is premised upon a way of looking at why the U.S. is in Afghanistan to begin with, which you elaborated on a bit. What if you take a different view of why the U.S. is in, in Afghanistan? For instance, to surround, to begin the surrounding of the Soviet, former Soviet Union, to block that, to capture that, and it's still part of um, a geo-expansionist enterprise. And, the same, you know, and you could also look at Africa in the same way. Why is AFRICOM in, you know, and being developed in Africa it's part of the same thing. And that would leave us with a different set of alternative strategies, although it might look the same for now and hassling the Congress people as much as we can. But there are other options then that would come open and others that would be foreclosed. Well, I guess a very good point, and I would, I would be the first to uh, say that that's a factor. The trouble I have is when the people that are arguing for the war only argue about how can we protect ourselves from Al-Qaeda, and they never give the other reasons they might be there, and you discover the reasons later. And it turns out some of them are surprising. You know, like Wolfowitz said uh, that the, the reason they chose weapons of mass destruction is because about 11 people were in the room, and it was the only reason that they could agree on uh, for going into Iraq. It had nothing to do with 
the other reason, and I keep turning, well, what is the other reason? And of course, they don't say it, because they don't talk about this stuff. I, I, I think it's a very good question, and we should raise it everywhere, including Europe. What is NATO doing in Asia? You know that Obama's national security advisor, General James Jones, was the head of NATO, right? And he is on record as having said that without Afghanistan, NATO might fall apart. Is that why NATO is in Asia? What are Russia and China and Pakistan and India to think of NATO being in Asia? Why not the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which, my goodness, is composed of countries from Asia? Maybe they should be involved in stabilization or whatever the solution is. So that's one thing. Your point is very well taken. The other, there's a guy who's more fringe than I am and far more brilliant. I urge you to go online and get him. His name is Pepe Escobar. You know him? He, he writes these, he writes for Asian Times. And he's, he's, a, he's a very vivid correspondent, but he knows what he's talking about. And he, his books are, they're short books, but they all say, we're in Afghanistan because we're in Pipelanistan. In other words, Afghanistan has resources, yes, but it's really uh, the search for a pipeline that is secure and outside the reach of Russia. Um, and the, the pipeline is not only, we're not only talking about a pipeline that was negotiated once between the State Department and the Taliban in Afghanistan, you know that one, back when we were on best of terms with these people. Uh, it's Karachi. Think Karachi. Think Baluchistan. Think Balkanization of Pakistan. That's what's really going on is Pak Southern Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Pashtun areas, uh, represent a national movement for self-determination uh, that will become autonomous or lead to the rupture and balkanization of these countries. And at the southernmost point down there around Karachi is the only place where oil tankers could port. So there are these layers, and I think we need to study all of this, not for the purposes of becoming um, caught up in a perfectly, in, in a perfect theory and say, you know, a kind of aha theory or a conspiratorial theory. Now we've got it figured out, realizing then that we can do nothing about it except pass on the literature to other people to read. Um, but it's not enough to just give the arguments I gave for ending the war in Afghanistan. I think you do have to uh, accompany it with a further study of what this long war is about. They say it started with uh, jihadism on September 11th, all right? Um, but it does happen to be in all of these zones of Muslim majority population and all of these zones that are sitting on oil and gas reserves or potential pipelines. They will say, oh no, it has nothing to do with that. And on it goes, but we should at least reveal that. And, and it leads to certain conclusions, uh, not aha, but more like going to the environmentalists among us and the environmental part of our own consciousness and saying, you know, Sierra Club, NRDC people, how can you not take up foreign policy? You say you're against global warming. You say you're against uh, uh, the, you know, health problems caused by oil pollution. Well, we need the power of the environmental movement to join the peace movement. And they, they just are so compartmentalized, they don't see that the place where the environment is being most systematically and completely and rapidly destroyed happens to be in this arc of the 50-year war. That's it. But what's a peace movement without an environmental movement? Then you have the National Organization for Women. They're taking the position that the war in Afghanistan is the only thing 
keeping the women of Afghanistan from the Taliban. That, dis that discussion has got to be respectfully engaged. Um, we have a, a splintering, splintering of all these movements, and without, max, without unity, um, all the movements are weaker. So we're, I think, only in the early stages of trying to get an agreement on what is going on here and how to end it. And I, I think your level of, of entering a discussion is really important. It's just hard to put it on a, a placard on Flatbush Avenue. <laughs> you know, there's got to be different levels of engagement. Yes, there, the lady with the... I'm on the Latin America Committee. Uh, Obama might have immediately declared the Honduran military takeover a military coup, which he has not done. Uh, apparently, under, uh, under the advice, yes, I've heard Greg's, many of his reports on this. And my question has to do, again, going back to the Democratic Party, is um, it, the Congress is not going to do it. Obama is waffling. And, he, and here, Zelaya is in the Brazilian consulate, in the Brazilian embassy, with, uh, with radical sound assaults and, and who knows what kind of chemicals. If, if we don't have an alternative to the Democratic Party, if we're not willing to build candidacies that are independent and outside, what kind of incentive is there for the Democrats to change in the direction of the popular movements. I, I think that's, that's a, a viable approach depending on what constituency or community you're in. I don't have a quarrel with that. I thought your question was about Honduras, but... It is. No, it was about the Democratic Party and building pressure on the Democratic Party. Yeah. I'm happy to uh, have met you tonight. But a question I'd like to ask, do you believe do you believe that when the American public begins to realize that the arms for hostages in uh, Iran at the time Reagan was uh, president, that that is the contributing factor to what is happening today? Because to end the Vietnam War, that distinguished senator, Senator Javits' amendment said the United States could never engage in overseas involvement unless it gave Congress 60 days notice. Congress went to sleep, Reagan did what he had to do, and this was when you get uh, 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 the, the guy they're looking for now. Uh, Osama bin Laden was working for, for the United States at the time. Do you think that's the, the real thing? Well, no, in keeping with what I said earlier, I think there was a, a brief, a brief, I will, I will. There was a brief moment at the end of the 60s where everything was up for grabs, uh, especially after the Nixon scandal and Watergate. And there were some restrictions imposed on the FBI and the CIA, not enough, but some. Uh, and there was a revulsion against policing the world. Uh, and all that was wiped out with Reagan. Uh, and then when Bush put the additional uh, final exclamation point on it by invading in Gulf War I, declaring that the Vietnam Syndrome had been defeated. So he was actually carrying out a war to wipe out the last vestige of the cultural achievements of the 60s which to, was to develop a public skepticism about secret war and, and, uh, and, and war itself. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I think it did, uh, it did go back to that point. I want to say a word on Iran, um, just where this fits. Um, it, Iran is very hard to see through if you're looking at the current debate, the narrow debate. But if you think of um, Iran and Guatemala as the beginning of the period we're talking about, the beginning of the uh, systematic overthrows of these uh, governments, not really the beginning, in the 40s in Europe as well, um, the, the key here is that the United States refuses to acknowledge, although Obama slightly referred to it, 
refuses to acknowledge that our CIA overthrew their democratically elected government of Prime Minister Mossadegh uh, in an effort to help recapture control of their oil for the British. And it was devastating and traumatic and set this current history in motion, I think, even more than uh, the events you're referring to. And there won't be a solution uh, to their quest for security until they are convinced that never again will the United States or Western powers try to subvert their republic or their arrangements. And that's at the root of this. And it's amazing how hard it is for an American president to acknowledge this. It's as if, like, the whole lid will blow off our secret history. Well, maybe it shouldn't come off. Clinton had the same problem. He never said a word about Iran, but he said something that nobody mentioned in the front pages towards the end of his presidency. And I don't know if you remember this. He said about Guatemala, something like this. We've done terrible things in your country. We've, we've hired and deployed thugs and killers and just for the most atrocious and inhuman acts. And, and I'm sorry for this, or something like that. I, I don't even know why he said it, but, but it was an amazing acknowledgement. And until we're ready to say that, I think um, that history won't, uh, it, won't, uh, it won't end. All right, maybe one more and then. All right, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. I've been wondering, um, based upon the fact that we're spending nearly 4,000, based upon the fact that we're spending nearly $4,000 a second, on these wars, I'm wondering whether it's possible to put um, pressure upon Congress from on the basis that a de-escalation a de-escalation of the wars would be a de-escalation of military spending, which could jumpstart the American economy. Maybe we could also do this through the trade <coughs> unions, like the UAW, which has lost a lot of jobs. Yeah, I think the idea of Keynesianism, pump priming, seems to apply only to the Pentagon, right? Otherwise, it's a heresy against free enterprise. Um, so I think the argument should be made, and it's especially going to be effective in areas that don't have big uh, military bases. I would suggest, for instance, I don't know about Brooklyn, do you have a military base? Uh, you know, the reason... The reason that the voters in Iowa are so progressive is that Iowa doesn't have military contracts. They don't have a defense industry. So if you want to get anything going for the peace movement in a campaign sense, you always want to start in Iowa because it just gets worse after Iowa. You just have to master the economics of agriculture and come out for, for protection for Iowa farmers and a few other things. But, but everybody in Iowa is for peace without reservation because they don't have, their economy is not tied to it. Yes. Do you know nationalpriorities.org? Yeah, that's a, I think all of us on all of our websites and all of our billboards and all of our literature should always, I terribly apologize for getting that. It's one of the most useful resources. You can tell how many tax dollars are spent up to the second in Brooklyn that could go to nurses or could go to high school teachers or a, a Head Start and the, uh, the figures are just staggering and if I get around the country and I tell them to people, they don't, they literally don't know what is being spent specifically in their community or state. So it's a very good organizing tool, very good tool. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Uh, again, let me ask you to do just a few things. We're having a reception downstairs. We hope you'll join us to continue the conversation.